Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be doing a review of The Card Turner by Louis Sakar. So Sakar is the guy who wrote Holes. He also wrote a book called Small Steps, which I really enjoyed. I think I've actually reviewed both of these, so I will be linked below if I remember, to any uh, reviews of Sakar that I've done. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs before sharing my overall thoughts and rating at the end. This is very much going to be one of those where I review it as I go along, um, but although I haven't said that, I don't expect it's going to take me longer than a couple of days to read this. So, Dane reads. The summer is looking bleak for Alton Richards. His girlfriend has dumped him to go out with his best friend. He has no money and no job. And then his parents insist that he drives Uncle Lester to his bridge tournaments four times a week. Uncle Lester is old, blind, very sick and very rich. Which is why his parents are desperate for Alton to worm his way into his good books. But they're in competition with other distant relatives. Not expecting much from the Altings, Alton soon finds himself getting to know a lot about his uncle, his family's history and pretty Tony Castaneda, another contender for Uncle Lester's inheritance. So um, yeah, let's go through, check out some tab. So there's the line, uh, December 25th might have come and gone, but there was a sense that Christmas was still around, just around the corner because his parents are hoping to get this inheritance. But I thought that was interesting because I mean, it's literally the 3rd of January 2022 as I'm filming this. Um, and then he kind of breaks the fourth wall here at the start of chapter three. He goes, uh, this is very embarrassing. Have you ever been in a situation where you've been with someone for a while and you don't know that person's name? It's too late to ask, but you know the longer you go without asking, the more awkward it will become. So even though you feel really stupid, you finally just have to bite the bullet and say, by the way, what's your name? That's how I'm feeling right now, only in reverse. By the way, my name is Alton Richards. And just a great line here, I love this. Uh, Mrs. Mahoney didn't like the new nurse either and complained to my mother that Teodora paraded around the house half naked. Which half, I asked. My mother ignored my question. When Mrs. Mahoney suggested to her that she might want to dress more appropriately, do you know what Teodora said? What does it matter? He can't see me. Fair. I mean, you might accidentally like rub an elbow up against a nipple or something, I don't know. And so Uncle Lester loses his sight and we get this conversation, which I, I enjoyed. He's been playing cards four days a week with Tony Castaneda, my mother informed us one evening, her voice stewed in bitterness. I didn't see how that was possible. What can they play? Leslie asked me later in my room. Go fish. Do you have any sevens? Then what? Tony looks at his cards to see if he has any sevens. She could cheat like so easily. Why would she cheat an old man who's about to die? I asked. It's probably just the opposite. He asks her if she has any sevens and she says, darn it, you got me again and hands him a six and a king. And then he changes his will and leaves her all his money, said Leslie. But no, they're playing bridge. And he has like a remarkable memory so she can tell him what cards he's got and he can kind of follow the game from there. And we get this uh, little exchange and I just like the way th this kind of shows a running theme throughout the book where like the author, the main character in it, um, like addresses the reader so he'll think I'm crazy, I protested. No, he'll respect you for your integrity. I'm not being unintegritary, I replied. Don't bother looking up that word. And so we have uh, the basics here and there's a little picture of a whale. I don't know if you can see it, it's there. And it says, do you see that picture of a whale? It's going to be our secret code. Okay, maybe it's not so secret. This year I had to read Moby Dick in my language arts slash English class. It seemed like a pretty good adventure story about a monster killer whale, but just when I started to get into it, the author, Herman Melville, stopped the story and went on page after page describing every tiny detail of a whaling ship. I zoned out. I never finished the book and had to bluff my way through the test. The reason I'm telling you this is because I'm about to attempt to explain the basics of bridge. My guess is that there's going to be a lot more bridge in this book as well. Uh, there's no way I'm going to try and teach you how to play bridge, there's no way I could do that. I'll just try to explain enough of the basics that if you want, you might be able to understand some of the bridge stuff that happens. Um, but also the idea behind putting the whale there is you can skip past it if you would like as well. But I thought it was pretty cool that it does teach you a little bit about bridge whilst having a decent standalone story as well. And we have the housing crisis explained by a teenage kid here, and he does a really good job of it. I'd heard vaguely about something called the housing crisis, but it didn't mean much to me until that moment. What happened was this. A lot of banks made bad loans. People couldn't pay them back, and many people lost their homes. The banks lost a lot of money and stopped making new loans, which meant people stopped buying houses, which meant builders stopped building houses, which meant nobody needed insulation material, which meant my father was out of a job. And a great little quote here that is very apt as a teenager, but it never goes away. <laughs> it's funny how you can go from hating a girl to maybe liking her, maybe liking her a lot, just because she shows a little interest in you. Yeah, true that, kid. And we get, like, surprisingly philosophical here as well, so I'm just going to read this out here. 
so this is um, him talking to Trap, who Trap is Lester Trap, his granddad. Um, think about it, he said. Ideas evolve, they reproduce. That's the very definition of life. They reproduce, asked Gloria. Through communication, said Trap. Are you aware, Alton, that another word for communication is intercourse? Gloria laughed. I think I might have blushed, but fortunately Trap couldn't see me. The urge to communicate is even stronger than the sex drive, Trap said. Why do you think people gossip so much? Why can't we keep secrets? Why have we invented the printing press, the telephone, the internet? It's so ideas can grow and reproduce. Our bodies, our brains are just machines that ideas use for a while, then toss aside when they wear out. Okay, I said, but here we are talking about the idea that ideas are alive, right? So who are we talking about that idea? Don't worry if my question doesn't make sense to you. It doesn't make sense to me now either as I write this, although I think I understood it when I asked it. When you think of yourself, Alton, when you think me, what comes to mind? Do you think about what you look like? Your arms, your legs, your face? Or is the me that's inside you something else? And um, they're playing against somebody and this is just a, a great little biting comeback from Gloria. Uh, the, director, the director told us to go on to the next hand and advised everyone to treat the other players with respect. This is a zero tolerance tournament. Well, it's very distracting when we have to keep saying every card out loud, complained East. I'm sorry my partner's blindness makes life so difficult for you, said Gloria. End chapter on a mic drop. And uh, here we learn a bit more about the way Trap's mind work and how he was able to keep all of the cards like in his mind and to follow the play that was happening. Trap didn't need hand records. He could tell you who held the jack of clubs on board 11 or how many hearts were in the east hand on board too. I don't think he purposefully set out to memorise every three of spades or seven of clubs. I think it's more like the way you or I memorise song lyrics. You might not think you know all the words to a song, but then you hear the music and you sing the first line, and that leads to the next line, and before you know it, you've sung the whole song. That's how it was with Trap and Bridge Hands. He'd remember the cards he held, and then the decisions he had to make during the bidding, and the opening lead, and it would all just flow from there. Gloria described it to me another way. She said that Trap was like a brilliant detective solving a crime. Each card was a clue. West had the ace of diamonds, East showed up with a singleton club. Trap wouldn't forget those clues any more than a detective would forget a bloody knife found under a mattress. Hmm. And for me as a detective novel reader but not much of a bridge player, that was pretty interesting. And then again, this is something else I can relate to because of my weird sleep. The next morning, afternoon technically, I was awakened by a call from Tony. Yeah, happens to me a lot. Well, I generally don't wake up when my phone rings, I just ignore it. And they reference synchronicity, uh, which Trap describes as when two related things occur without any apparent cause and effect. And um, one of my ex-girlfriends was really into synchronicity. I just think of coincidences personally, but you know. It would have been synchronicity if she'd messaged me after I just read that, but she didn't. So, happy days. <laughs> oh, and then he starts to wonder if Tony is his cousin and whether Trap is her grandfather. Um, because some hanky-panky may or may not have gone down years ago. But if she is his cousin, it's kind of weird because he has a crush on her. I guess not. It's just unfortunate for him. So Alton ends up getting involved in playing bridge himself. Um, but here's a section when he sees Tony. I just think this is a nice little line. From across the room, Tony smiled and waved at me. I don't think there's anything better than seeing a pretty girl smile and wave at you. The way her face lights up when she catches your eye. It's kind of a complicated thing here. There's a guy called Henry King, basically, um, who wanted to get, into, he was getting into politics and his wife was into bridge. Um, and he got to the point where they would get invited to the White House. Um, and he says here, he turned down a presidential invitation, making up, some, making up some excuse about why he couldn't attend the bridge game. That's okay, Henry, Ike said to him. We don't really want you anyway. Just send your charming wife. That was the first time he hit her. But it wasn't the last trap said. He also forbid her to ever play bridge again. You have to understand, Alton, said Gloria. Those were different times. In many ways, a woman was considered the property of her husband. Especially if your husband was someone as rich and as powerful as Henry King, said Trap. He was also 13 years older than her, so she felt dominated in that way as well. Um, and if he found out she'd been to a bridge tournament, he'd beat her. I am the king, that maniac would shout at her. It is your duty to serve and protect the king. What an asshole. And a great little one-two here. You should never play bridge with your wife, Arnold told me. It will ruin your marriage. Even worse, it will ruin your bridge game, said Lucy. And uh, basically, King uh, got Annabelle sent to this uh, like insane asylum, basically, and used his power to keep her there. And it says, 
he controlled the judges too. The judge said he couldn't do anything without a signed affidavit from Annabelle. But how were they supposed to get a signed affidavit if they weren't allowed to see her? Not even the other patients were allowed to see her. She was kept isolated for more than two years. She wasn't insane when she entered Rolling Brook, said Gloria, but after two years. The only way Trapp could find out any information about Annabelle was to wait in the parking lot and then bribe the orderlies and janitors when they got off work. Most had never seen her, but they had heard rumours about her and they heard her screams. She wasn't being beaten. Her screams were screams for attention. At some point, Annabelle managed to obtain a bottle of bleach from a janitor's cart. When Arnold first mentioned the bottle of bleach, I actually felt hopeful. I thought that maybe she threw bleach in a doctor's face, then escaped out a window into Trapp's waiting arms. I watched too much TV. She committed suicide by drinking the bleach. It took her several times because she kept vomiting it back up. Man, that's, that's rough and very, like, quite dark for a, you know, a young adult book. And we get a reference to the old thing, so this is chapter 49, a monkey and a typewriter. Supposedly, if one million monkeys randomly pressed the keys on one million typewriters for one million years, one of those monkeys, at some point in time, will type Lincoln's Gettysburg address. And he kind of compares that to playing bridge, like, if the monkeys, if a monkey can potentially do that, then I can play a winning bridge hand. And then later on in that chapter, he says, I decided I didn't believe that thing about monkeys and typewriters. If Lincoln's Gettysburg address could be typed solely by accident, then that would mean it would be almost typed millions of times with maybe just a couple of words wrong. Four score and six years ago, a government of the people, by the people and smell the eggplant. It would also mean that those monkeys would randomly type millions of other works too, including a page out of the phone book with every name in alphabetical order and every phone number correct. Well, it's right. I've kind of thought that too. Not those specific examples, but a similar kind of line of, line of thought. And um, Tony goes to a party and she says, It was so lame, I had to wear the stupid poodle skirt and every song sounded like rock around the clock. I don't get why people think the 50s were so great. Well, it's because of the music, but not every song sounds like rock around the clock, mate. And we get this great little bit of uh, representation here. So there's basically a guy called Sid Fox is doing this like demonstration of bridge and he said, he asked the audience to give it a go and he says, if you get it wrong, I'll chop off your head. Like this is the way the story goes. Uh, if you get it wrong, the king will chop off your head. If you get it right, you can marry the prince or the princess. So it goes, a, a woman finally got it right. She said she'd lead dummies ace. Next she'd lead dummies three. And if East plays low, she'd play the eight. Congratulations, Sid Fox told her. You may marry the prince. I'll take the princess if you don't mind, the woman said. And everyone laughed. Just a nice little way to sort of, to normalise that, I think, you know? And then I don't really understand why this happens. Uh, so they're in this hotel because they've gone to this bridge tournament and it goes, I didn't use the hotel pillow, just the pillowcase, which I stuffed with my dirty clothes. It was soft enough, but lumpy. Why not just use the pillow? And um, basically, um, Tony and Anton, like they think they're channeling uh, Annabelle and Lester, so the uncle and the woman who committed suicide. So he tells some people the truth. He says, I called what we'd done channeling, which seemed more credible than saying I heard my dead uncle speak to me. That's a spoiler, by the way. Uncle dies. They really had no choice but to believe us. It was either that or they had to believe that two people who had been playing bridge for less than three months had outplayed all the best players in the world. The impossible is more believable than the highly improbable. Consider the monkey and the typewriter. Imagine you walk into a room and actually see a monkey typing the Gettysburg address, including all the punctuation and correct capitalization. Would you believe it was random luck, or would a different, totally impossible explanation be more acceptable to you? Maybe that's what religion is all about. Is life just a highly improbable coincidence, or does an impossible explanation make more sense? It's just a highly improbable coincidence. Uh, and then at the end we have some of Sakar's notes about it as well. So on page 28 he wrote, She was nicely dressed, as were most of the women in the room. It was mostly the men who were slobs. And he writes here, I have a theory about that. Bridge requires such a high degree of concentration. You want to be comfortable so as not to have to think about anything else. Women feel comfortable when they're confident about the way they look. Men feel comfortable when they're, well, when we're comfortable. Not every man and not every woman, of course, but it occurs often enough for Alton to have noticed. And just that was, that was interesting. So yeah, The Card Turner by Louis Sakar, uh, four out of five for me, very much enjoyed. Um, so this is my third Sakar novel, and I mean, he's definitely one of those authors that I look out for. I hopefully want to read all of his books uh, by the end. Uh, as I mentioned, it does remind me a bit of uh, Cards on the Table by Agatha Christie, just because it does have this, like, you're following actual play-by-play -play of games and stuff. Um, I think for some people that would be a turn-off. I mean, I know nothing about Bridge and I'm not particularly interested in it, but it wasn't so much that I couldn't enjoy the novel, you know? Uh, if anything, it's the other way around where actually reading this made me slightly more interested in Bridge, so I think that's pretty cool. So yeah, um, make of that as you will. I would recommend it. Check it out. 
So there you have it, that's what I made of the card turner by Louis Sackart. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.